on our Google Plus uh, featuring the Butterfly Garden. Um, we are actually live in the Aveda Butterfly Garden today with a couple special people. Um, we have Hale Nordemeyer, who is a Minnesota Zoo keeper, and he works with the butterflies and the birds. And we also have Dr. Eric Ronquist, who is a conservation Hi. biologist here. And um, we'll just go ahead and get started. So, Kale, why don't you go ahead and start? Hi, guys. I want to welcome you all to the Aveda Butterfly Garden. So here in this exhibit, this is just a seasonal exhibit here at the Minnesota Zoo. We're just open during our summer months. And we exhibit a number of North American native species of butterflies here. So everything here are things that oftentimes you find in your backyard. We will usually, over the course of the summer, have about 100 to 140 different species exhibited here. And every week, we'll have thir about 30 to 40 of them. And they'll constantly be changing. This is a kind of an ever-evolving exhibit. So from week to week, it'll always be a little bit different. So this is a real fun place. Awesome. Um, and Kale, why don't you tell us a little bit more about um, the exhibit and what else they can find here. It's not just um, live butterflies, but they can find species that are in different growing phases, correct? That's right. So we wanted to show the entire life history of the butterflies. So we'll also have off caterpillar exhibits. We'll also be able to show off our butterfly chrysalis. You know, a lot of the time people don't think of the pupil form of the butterflies, but many of them are just spectacular. They have beautiful structures, and in the wild they may be very cryptic, but they're very artistic. They're just beautiful things, so we're able to show all parts of those life histories here. In addition to the butterfly collection that we have, we then also have a beautiful garden that's set up, and what's blooming in here is will also be changing as well. And we try to show off a number of fabulous nectar plants, things that people can plant in their own yards to attract butterflies. Very cool. Um, and it's not just butterflies that are in here. We also have um, another species of flying creatures, correct? <laughs> well, no, I don't know want to describe them as different species, but we do also have a number of moth species. And if we want to be real correct about it, so all butterflies and moths are part of a real large order of insects called the Lepidoptera. These are the scaly winged insects. They have little scales on their wings that give them their beautiful colors. And they're all part of the same order. Butterflies and moths are part of that. And if you want to be real correct about it, both butterflies are in fact a moth. They're just a specialized group of day-flying moths, similar to how a hummingbird is a specialized day-flying, nectar-feeding bird. Awesome. And so let's switch gears a little bit, um, and let's go on over to Dr. Eric Runquist, who is a conservation biologist here at the Minnesota Zoo. And he works specifically with um, a prairie project that he will um, talk a little bit more specifically about. Yeah, thank you. And welcome to the Aveda Butterfly Garden. It's a gorgeous day. The butterflies are flying, finally. Yeah, so I've been interested in butterflies since I've been a little kid. I've been racing and running after butterflies since I was little. And I've always been really fascinated with their biology, with their interesting life histories, with the amazing diversity of butterflies. Now, a major feature of work at the Minnesota Zoo is conservation. It's really at kind of very much at the core of what we do as, as a zoo organization, as a conservation organization, first and foremost. Um, and so Minnesota is actually home to some really interesting ecosystems, and several of which are in real trouble. So for example, um, Minnesota is the only state in the country where you can experience boreal forests up north. Maybe you have a log cabin up in the woods. Here in the Twin Cities, we are in deciduous forests, which are you know, extending then all the way down into the eastern United States. And then as you go out west, you run into the prairie. And prairie is a very interesting, unique ecosystem, very complex and surprisingly diverse. Prairies generally are treeless habitats. They extend all the way over um, into the slope of the Rockies and extend from southern Canada into, say, northern Texas. In Minnesota, we are in an ecosystem called the tall grass prairie. And that's na that name is not an accident. Many of the plant species can be as tall as me, except they're, ju they're not trees, they're not shrubs, they're, they're grasses or other flowering plants. So they're really interesting, but not only it's the above ground piece and the number of species that you can find. You can find hundreds of species of, of prairie plants at one spot, but also if you look below ground, those roots are going to go twice as deep as me into the ground, so it's like 15 feet into the ground or more. So 
there can be two to three times the amount of biomass below ground as above ground. And, and all of that complexity creates a really rich soil. And that's actually what forms the U.S. Corn Belt and the Soybean Belt. That's most of where you, the richest farmland in the U.S. came from. It's from the native prairie that was, that was here historically. Now, Minnesota's prairie is largely gone. And it was, I think we have a picture, actually, of number one. Um, this is historically what a lot of Minnesota looked like. Minnesota had the western, southern, and third, southern and western third of the, of the state was all prairie. And this landscape of beautiful flowering plants extended this entire range, about 18 million acres in Minnesota. Now, unfortunately, most of that is gone, and it's, we, we depend on that, that acreage uh, now as, as larger corn land uh, and cropland, but all of the plants and animals that rely on that habitat are now in real trouble. There's only 1% of the historic native prairie left in Minnesota. We've had about 18 million acres. This is picture number two. Uh, we had about 18 million acres, but now we're only about 235,000 acres, so only at 1%. And so anything that's really reliant on that native prairie ecosystem, instead of these vast seas of prairie extending hundreds of miles in any direction, now we're just talking about little individual islands, each with their own problems on their own histories. Um, and so all of the plants and animals that depend on it, like the butterflies, are in real trouble. And so the Minnesota Zoo launched a program a year and a half ago focusing on prairie butterflies as a real problem. There are 15 butterflies in the state of Minnesota that are considered to be threatened, endangered, or of special concern. That's a legal des definition. Um, and 10 of those 15, so two-thirds of the butterflies that are deemed to be in trouble in the state are actually prairie endemics. They rely on the prairie. And so we're focusing on three species. This is picture number three, I believe. Um, three species that are really important and historically common in that it, that prairie landscape. The one is the Powashik skipperling. That should be on the left. Um, and that was probably the most Minnesotan of all butterflies in the world. We had um, half of all historic records from Minnesota. And that's a greater concentration than any other species in the world. So this is our butterfly. This is Minnesota's butterfly. The problem is not hasn't been seen in the state in six years. Hasn't been seen in Minnesota since 2007. But one of the most common butterflies in Minnesota is now apparently gone. It's also disappeared from North Dakota, South Dakota, and Iowa in that same time period. So that's 95% of the range of this butterfly it's, it's apparently disappeared in. So it's, it's really getting critically endangered. We're, we're maybe only talking about 1,500 to 2,000 individuals left in the world. The Dakota skipper is equally in trouble. Only a single individual was seen in, in Minnesota last year. And, um, and then the regal fritillary, this absolutely beautiful, big, gorgeous butterfly, really iconic of the prairie, ex extending all the way historically from Colorado to Nova Scotia and grassland ecosystems, now it's essentially extinct each of the Mississippi River. And it's now only really found in those isolated prairie patches. So. The Minnesota Zoo launched this prairie butterfly program to create insurance populations, conservation breeding programs to sort of create a, an emergency backstop in, in, in recognition of that rapid decline of all these species. And so we're, we're bringing some of the individuals in, eggs derived from wild females, rearing them here at the zoo. And if you come into the Aveda Butterfly Garden this summer, if you look to your right, right as you're entering, or your left, right as you're entering, um, you'll see a little hoop house, and that's where a lot of our work is being done right now. We're also facilitating field surveys, so we're going out and assessing the status of these butterflies. We don't even know if they're extinct in the state or, or across much of their range. And then we're also doing some other research, like studying the potential threats that are existing still, and we're also conducting some genetic studies that are totally unknown yet. So we're, we're really active in the state. We're not just, you know, an organization that's that's you know breeding tigers, and that's a really important piece. That we're we are the global center for tiger breeding and tiger uh, management. There's 60 other species here at the zoo that are part of a, a species survival plan, and um, so we're working both here at the zoo and not only in Minnesota but around the world supporting conservation work. And so, and to be able to do this as a job is amazing. I love it.
All right, I think we just had a short technical glitch. Um, thanks, Eric, for talking about uh, conservation and all of that stuff. Um, uh, if we yeah. actually have a we couple of other things that I'll talk to Kale about Kale also. About um, uh, and if yeah. we can actually have one of those uh, sign things uh, here, it actually yeah. is and a... What's the you guys? Yeah. So, Kale, if you can talk a little bit more about that uh, and what people can expect to find when they come here to the Veda Butterfly Garden as well. So when you come and visit the Veda Butterfly Garden, as I kind of mentioned before, this is a constantly changing exhibit. What species are actually in the garden will change from week to week. And we really encourage people to pick up one of these ID sheets as they start to walk through so you can ID what species you see. So you get to kind of know some of your butterflies. On the sheets, there's a little asterisk app for each name for ones that are found here in the state. But like I said, it could constantly be changing what we have. Excellent. All right, so we have a couple of questions for you guys um, that we've collected over Facebook and Twitter and Google Plus, of course. So let's go ahead and just start. And I think you guys mentioned this a little bit already, but how many different kinds or species of butterfly will we have here at the Minnesota Zoo this summer in the Veda Butterfly Garden? Our permit allows us to have up to 140 different species. However, at any given time, we'll probably only have 30 to 40 in the garden. Because most of these butterflies, as adults, aren't living very long, usually only about two to four weeks. So more are constantly coming in, and we're breeding individuals here, too. So over the course of the year, we'll see probably about 140. But when you come, expect to see 30 to 40 of those guys represented. Very cool. So the next question is coming to us from Twitter. And they're asking, how long does it take for a caterpillar to grow into a butterfly? Want to grab that one? Here? Yeah, that's a, that's a, it's a kind of a complicated question because it depends on the species. So the butterflies that we are working with, actually I actually have a graph of a picture of this. Um, the Powashik skipperling uh, is a caterpillar for most of its life. The adults are only alive for about two weeks of the year, and so the vast majority of the rest of that is as a caterpillar. So they hatch as a caterpillar in July, and then they feed on their, their native grasses, their, their native prairie grasses that they rely on as a host. And then winter comes, and what are you going to do when you're a caterpillar? you sit there and you get covered in snow. These are real Minnesotan butterflies. They, they, they have no problem at all just getting buried in snow and sitting like that all year. Um, they're pretty hardcore that way. And so then spring comes and they, they wake up almost instantly. The ones we were hibernating here at the zoo, they woke up very quickly. And so when they first hatch, they're tiny. They're, they're just like a millimeter and a half. Um, and then they grow to maybe half of a centimeter um, or half, sorry, half of a, or maybe five centimeters um, when they're fully grown. But right now they're they're kind of about the size of a penny. They're pretty tiny, and that's ten months old. In contrast, the regal fritillary caterpillars that I have, they don't do anything. They actually hatch in September, and they don't feed at all until spring. So they're these little pinhead-sized caterpillars that sit there, also on the ground, buried in snow, and they just hope that they're next to a violet, which is their host plant and wake up next spring and then feed. But they grow much more rapidly. They have to get from the full size of the caterpillar up to this big butterfly, which is you know, you know, a good three inches across, um, and do that in two months. So right now, they've, they've actually already outgrown the Powashi caterpillars that I had starting last June. Um, it gets even more complicated, though. Some species will just you know, do, do really quickly, but some actually take two years to mature as caterpillars. There are species that live in the far north, uh, in the boreal regions of Alaska and northern Canada, where it's so cold and the growth season is so short that it takes the caterpillars actually two years to gain all the biomass needed. So it's a very complicated situation. And it depends on the species. Good question. An example of what Eric just mentioned species that might take a little bit longer are ones that you guys are, might be pretty familiar with at home. Woolly bears or Isabella moths. They're the orange and black ones that you'll oftentimes find at the end of each season when you go to rake. And then just kind of follow up that with that with caterpillars. Now he described two species that will overwinter as larvae, so they take about a full, almost a full year then to fully mature. Some as larvae take a little bit shorter time. So I don't know if these guys will focus in. Josh, are those guys focusing at all? Um, it's an autofocus, so you can kind of get a glimpse of them though. Sure. 
Well, what I'm trying to show you guys here is a really fun species of butterfly. This is called a morning cloak. And these guys actually overwintered here in Minnesota as adult butterflies. They're, or I should say their parents overwintered here as adult butterflies. Their parents, when it started to get warm out, laid eggs on willows. That's what their caterpillars like to eat. And these guys have hatched out and now are growing. These are about fourth in stars, so they're about two weeks old at this point. They've got another week to go before they form chrysalis. So much faster development time. And then they'll survive most of our summer and they themselves will overwinter as butterflies. Excellent. All right, so our next question is, once they become a butterfly, What's the general lifespan for them once that happens? Most species, it's actually pretty short, only about two to three weeks. Some species, like these guys, are kind of the exception where, as adults, they might live 10 to 11 months. But most species of butterflies, once they emerge from their first look, live about two to three weeks. And some, and some species, that actually varies by generation, too. Monarchs, in the summer, the adults are only around for a couple of weeks as adults. They, they breed fairly constantly in, in the, the northern U.S. and then migrate back down to Mexico in the fall and that in the, that generation actually has to survive the entire winter as an adult without breeding and then when spring comes again they migrate back up into the southern U.S. they would start reproducing and then their progeny which just started showing up here in the Twin Cities about a week ago now they're going to be breeding here for the rest of the summer before they move south so one generation lived about six months seven months Others are a couple weeks, so it, it depends. Very cool. And our next question is uh, maybe a little bit more for Eric, um, but I'm sure Kale can speak to it as well. How many butterfly species are native to Minnesota? That's also kind of a hard question. I think there are about 170 that have been absolutely recorded in the state, but some of those are so rare that they, they probably don't really fully constitute a a real membership in our, in our state. So out of the 170, maybe 20 are sort of so irregular that we can't really consider them. You know, it's like a really rare bird showing up. Are you going to count that as part of the Minnesota fauna or not? So maybe about 150 are, could be encountered in any given year in Minnesota. In the prairies, about 50 of those species are existing. Um, and about a dozen of those are entirely dependent on prairie. So. Most of the butterflies that live on the prairie are also in trouble. All right. And then our next question is, what is the difference between a moth and a butterfly? I think I touched on this a second earlier, and if you want to add anything to this, Eric, go ahead. But one of the messages that I really try to get across to our guests that come to here is that they're all part of this large order of insects called Lepidoptera. They're named such, lepi meaning scale, so they're the scaly winged insects. Even butterflies are moths, so they're all moths. Just yeah. butterflies happen to be a very specialized group of day flying moths, and they tend to be kind of characterized by having smooth, clubbed antennas, but they're all part of this large order of insects yeah. called the Lepidoptera. There are about 10 times as many species of moths as butterflies. So butterflies are completely nested within all of the greater moths. And there's maybe in the world about 17 and a half thousand species of butterflies. They ranges from 15, I think, up to 28,000, depending on who you ask. Um, but then the moths are going to be 10 to 15 times as diverse as that. So we're talking maybe 200,000 species of moths worldwide. So butterflies are just one little piece of that. Most of the moths are at night. Um, there are plenty of day-flying moths, though, just as many during the day, actually. Um, in general, though, if you have a question, um, a moth, that, especially the male moths, are going to have more fan or feather-like antenna, and the butterflies are going to be these little clubs on the end. So, I mean, just because the moth, if you think of a moth as, yeah, it's going to be boring and brown, and there's some a beautiful butterfly or moths out there. Some amazing I encourage ones. everybody to come out and check out some of the ones that we have here. Will you have? We have five different species of giant silk moths exhibited in the garden, usually emerging daily. So, and some of these are just beautiful. Luna moths, Cecropia, Polyphemus. I really encourage you guys to come out and see them. They're just yeah. fabulous. Awesome. So, the last question we have is for both of you. And so, what is your favorite kind of butterfly? <laughs> 
That's hard. It's like picking which child you love most. There's and there's so many of them that it's hard to pick. Um, I tend to like the ones that are not always obvious or that people don't know as much about, but have some really fascinating stories. So, um, I, I particularly am a fan of a group called the Hair Streaks. They have these little tails on the end. I believe I have a picture of a hair streak. I just threw one in there. Um, this is a picture of an, it's an Acadian hair streak. It's actually native to Minnesota and Minnesota prairies. Their caterpillars feed on willows. Um, and hair streaks get their name from these little streaks of tails of, that are coming off the back pair of wings. And the, around those tails are frequently some bright orange patches, uh, maybe some blue patches too. And these things are feisty. They're little. They're, they're, their wingspan is only maybe going to be an inch or so. But they're fast, and the males are especially territorial. And so they're going to be patrolling their environment. They maybe pick one shrub that they, they pick as theirs, and they're going to be patrolling around for females and defending off anything else. I've seen them try to chase away birds that would be otherwise their predators. They're really a, a fascinating group. Uh, but also with those tails, that concentration of tail plus orange spots is thought to be a fake head. Uh, is going to draw attention away from the more important parts of the body, the juicy part. And so when, actually, when, yeah, when they come down and land in a flower, their head, if the flower is right here and they're going to be landing in, their head is going to be facing towards the flower as they're flying in. But right as they land, they actually flip themselves around on the ground or on the flower. So now the tail is facing where the head was. And so they can use, uh, and then they'll do this with their wings. They'll, they'll wave them back and forth and gain it, draw attention towards that moving piece, which maybe a bird saw it come in and thought that's where the head's going to be. That's the juicy part. But it's just a tail. It has no real structural importance, and if they lose that, they can still fly, and fly just fine. So it's a, it's a good predator to turn. They're really fascinating butterflies. Kale? And for me, I think, again, it's really, really hard to say who your favorite is. Everybody's just got an amazing, each species has an amazing, amazing story, amazing life history. But because moths tend to get such a bad rap, I just have to say that probably my favorites are some of the giant silk moths, yeah. particularly Cecropia. Um, Halicoria cecropia, they're North America's largest species of moth. They're the largest insect. They might have a wingspan of six to eight inches. This is a really large, really amazing animal. Um, adults will only live usually three to five days. They only have vestigial mouth parts when they emerge in the late spring, early summer. So they don't feed as adults. So their spectacular beauty can only be appreciated for a very short time. But they're just neat animals. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you both, uh, Kale and Eric, for joining us today at our Google thank Plus you. Hangout featuring the Aveda Butterfly Garden. Um, so one last thanks to everyone. Uh, yeah, thank you. Here is one last shot of the Aveda Butterfly Garden that opens up this Saturday, June 15th. So if you are in the Twin Cities area, definitely head on up to the Minnesota Zoo and check us out. So thanks again. We'll see you at our next Google Hangout. Thank you, everybody.